Now that we've um, described how one creates programs and writes rules in the Wolfram language, I'd like to discuss programming style. Now, many people are used to procedural programming, uh, the kind of programming you see when you write a program in C or in BASIC or in uh, Python, uh, etc. Um, there's another style which is called functional programming, which is less commonly used, although it's becoming more significant every day. And it happens to be a style that's used in the Wolfram language, although one can use procedural style. It's far better to use the functional style, and that's what I want to show you how one can do that in the Wolfram language. So let's go through that. I want to first describe what we call making nested function calls. So let's consider the following. First, we'll calculate the tangent of 4, and we get the answer 1.15. And then we want to take the sine of that value. So we take the sine of that result, we use the percentage sign to indicate that we want the result of the previous um, input for the tangent of 4. So we're taking the sine of 1.15, and we get 0.9. Now we want to take the cosine of that value, and we do that, and we get 0 0.06. Now, that consists of one, two, three different function calls. First we took the tangent, then we took the sine, and then we took the cosine. We can actually combine all those function calls into one function call, which is a nested function call. What we can do is we can write the cosine of the sine of the tangent of 4. And notice when we do that, we get exactly what we got when we made each function call separately. And we did that without having to give a name to the result. In other words, when we calculated the tangent of 4, we didn't have to say, okay, now we're going to call that 1.15, we're going to call it x, and now we're going to take the sine of x. We were immediately able to apply sine to the tangent of 4 without having to declare an intermediate state value. And that's a characteristic of functional programming. And let's illustrate that. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to deal with a, start with a deck of cards. I'm going to create a deck of cards and then I'm going to shuffle it. I'm going to show you how we do that. And this requires the use of the built-in function, and this is why I emphasized earlier that when you're going to use the Wolfram language, you should learn as many of the built-in Wolfram language functions as you can because it'll run faster and why do you want to recreate a function that's already defined? So we'll make use of that. First, we're going to create a list that runs from 2 to 10. And the way we do that is by using the built-in range function. So here we've created a list of 2 to 10, all the integers. And now we're going to combine that list with a list of four symbols, J, Q, K, and A. And they stand for the jack, the queen, the king, and the ace. So when we join the list of numbers with the list of symbols, what we have then is a list of all of the cards in a given card suit. Okay, then we can apply a function which is called outer, and I won't go into the details, you can look up what outer is, to list and to this long list which consists of all the cards in a given suit, and we're going to combine that with a list which consists of the four suits. In other words, we're going to combine it with a club, or a diamond, or a heart, or a spade. And when we do that, we get a list which consists of four lists. Now let's look at these four lists. Let's look at the first list. What are that? Those are all the cards that are clubs. The second list consists of all the cards that are diamonds. The third, all the cards that are hearts. The last is all the cards that are spades. So we basically have created a deck of cards, except what we have are all of the clubs are in a row, and then we have all the spades, and we have all of each. So we'd like to sort of just create one list of 52 cards. Rather than having a list of four lists, let's just have one list that has every single card. And we do that using a flatten command. And again, these are commands that you learn by looking up in the Wolfram language the definitions. And when we do that, you see that what we have are 
all 52 cards in the deck of cards. But they're not random. They've been created in a specific way such that they're in order. You've got them first by suit, and within each suit, you've got them running from two all the way up to ace. So what we'd like to do, first of all, let's show how you could create this using one nested function call. Notice that here we took the range, then we took the result of that, and we joined it to another list, and then we took the result of that, and we applied a function called outer to that. So we can write all that as one nested function call, and this is what it looks like. We take flatten outer list, join range, and everything else in here, and what we create is a list of 52 cards. Now we want to shuffle it. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to take each card and we're going to pair it up with a randomly chosen number between 0 and 1. It'll be a random real number. So the first thing we do is we create a list of 52 random real numbers. We do that and then we couple each card with a random number. That's done by taking the transpose. Then we sort the result. Now when you sort this list, which consists of ordered pairs, where the first element of the ordered pair is a random number, and the second element is the card, and we sort it, what it does is it arranges it in increasing value of the random number. And because they're real numbers, no, card, no two cards will have the same random number. So what we're basically doing is creating a list which consists of all of these cards, but the order in which they appear is determined by the random number that we've attached to the card. So what we want to do now is you, we just get rid of the random number. Once we get rid of the random number, then we have a shuffled card. We have our cards in random order. And that's what this does. I just apply it. And after I do that, so what I've done is I've created my card deck. I've attached to each card in the card deck, all 52 of them, a random real number. Then I've sorted them in terms of the lowest random real number all the way up to the highest real number. Then I get rid, which basically randomizes the cards. I get rid of the random numbers, and what I'm left with are randomized card order. And that's what this is. Okay? So what we've done is we've made how many function calls? Transpose of sort of transpose. So one, two, three. We've had three function calls. And that's not counting the fact that we could have also put in creating the, the card deck itself. We could actually put in the nested call that created the card deck in here. And then we'd have five or six nested functions. Okay? But there's another way to do this just to show you. What I've done here is before the last step, what did I do in the last step? I got rid of the random numbers that were attached to each card. And the way I did that was by basically separating out the first element of each ordered pair from the second element. So that I had one list, again, of all the random numbers sorted, and then a second list of all the randomized order cards. So instead of doing it by making function calls, I can use a transformation rule. And that's what this does. It says take all the ordered pairs after you've done the evaluation of the expression, which basically created randomized ordered pairs, and get rid of the first part, because the first part is the random number, and the second part is the card. So this is basically saying randomize your cards using real numbers, and then get rid of the real numbers that you used to randomize the cards. And then all you're left with are the cards in random order. And as you can see, that works just as well. So that's two ways. So there you see making nested function calls or using transformation rules. Now we come to what's really a very important part of the Wolfram language, and this is anonymous functions. We've already described how we can create functions. There are built-in functions that come with the Wolfram language, and they're in the global rule base. And then we have user-defined um, functions. So we have rewrite rules, and they can be set functions, or they can be set-delayed functions. 
when we enter those functions, they go into the global rule base, and so they're used whenever is appropriate. But there are times when we want to have a function that never goes into the rule base, that's only used one time, and is only used when you want to use it. And for that purpose, we create anonymous functions. They're also known in computer science as pure functions. They are basically functions that have no names. So let's describe how that's done. Basically, an anonymous function is written by using the right-hand side of a rewrite rule where we replace the variable symbols, which are basically labeled blanks, with number one and number two, number three, etc. And we close the entire expression in parentheses followed by the ampersand sign. Now let me demonstrate what that means because that's a little bit abstract. Here's a rewrite rule that I've just created. It's the square of x is going to be converted into x squared. So if you took the square of 2 and you plugged in for x blank 2, it would return to you 2 squared and you'd get back 4. Or if you entered 5, it would take the square of 5 or this, and it would basically give you 25. Well, if we do that and we run that, then that definition of square is placed in the global rule base. And whenever you run a program or make an entry into the Wolfram language, it will look, and if it sees square, it's going to use that definition of square, and you don't want that. You only want it used one time. So here's how you do it as an anonymous function. Forget the left-hand side completely, and take the right-hand side, and take your dummy variable, and replace it with a pound sign. And then enclose that right-hand side, which is pound raised to two, with a parentheses, pair of parentheses, and an ampersand, and then put in the argument that you want to have that anonymous function applied to. So what this says is, take the argument and square it. And here the argument is 5, so you get back 25. Now, your argument in this case was a very simple number, but it could be more than one number. You can have more than one argument. Here's an example where we say pound 1 raised to the pound 2, and the arguments are 5 and 3. So what's going on here? Well, pound 1 is the first argument, which is 5, and pound 2 is the second argument, which is 3. So what this is doing is that this is an anonymous function which takes the first argument and raises it to the power of the second argument. So it's basically taking 5 and cubing it. And that's why you get 20, 125 as the answer. Okay. Now one thing which is very important to note. In the case I've just shown, I have two arguments, 5 and 3. In the case here, what I have is an ordered pair. Now, that's a single argument because it's a list. Don't get confused. There are not two arguments in here. There's a single argument, which is a list, which consists of the elements 2 and 3. So if you're going to feed in an ordered pair or a list, rather than using pound 1 and pound 2, you can just use pound, and you can take the first part of the argument, which is 2, and you raise it to the power of the second part of the argument, which is 3. So what you're doing is you're taking 2 to the 3, and here you get 8. So you want to distinguish and not confuse a list of elements as though each element were a separate argument. It's not. Okay, now, in the same way that we showed how you could nest functions, in shuffling a deck of cards, for example, you can nest anonymous functions. So let me show you how you can do that. Well, one thing to note is that in addition to being writing an anonymous function using parentheses and a pound sign and an ampersand, you can write it as function square bracket x and then the body of the argument that you're making. So let me show you how that works. Here, what we're doing is we're going to nest two anonymous functions. The first one takes the argument, which in this case is 3, and it adds 2 to it. That gives you 5. Then this becomes the argument of the second anonymous function. So now you put in the 5 
into the pound and you raise it to the third power, so you get 125. Okay? So that's a very straightforward nested anonymous function. But instead of doing it that way, you can also use the more formal notation for an anonymous function. So instead of using the parentheses and the ampersand and the pound sign, you can use what's called the function with a capital F. And that's exactly the same. So input number 141 is exactly the same as input number one. It's just written in a different notation. Okay? And you can use them together. In this case, the first anonymous function was written using that shorthand with the parentheses and the ampersand, and the other anonymous function was written using function with a capital F. And in the last case, the first function is written in the formal way, and the second function is written in shorthand. And it's really important that when you're going to nest anonymous functions, you can only use the shorthand notation, which is the parentheses and the ampersand form for one. Because if you use more than if you use it more than one time, what can happen is the Wolfram language gets confused and doesn't know what argument is being fed into what anonymous function. And so by doing it using the full form of the anonymous function, which is function, you avoid the confusion. So that's the important point. It is indeed possible to nest anonymous functions. You just can't write each anonymous function using shorthand notation. Okay. Now the next thing I want to turn to are higher order functions. Now higher order functions are functions which take other functions as arguments and or returns another function as a result. Okay, now we've actually seen this already done when we use the built-in apply function because in the apply function, the first argument to the apply function is a function. And we did that when we said apply plus to a list or apply list to a summation. And to show you how that works, that can work in several ways. Here, I wrote apply f to a list which consists of two ordered pairs. And what it does is it replaces the head of the argument with f. So it replaces the list on the outside with f. So now the ordered pair a, b, and the ordered pair c, d become the arguments of f. But let's say we want to not do that. We don't want to replace the entire list with the function f. We just want to replace the ordered pairs within the list. So we can apply f at different levels of the expression. And here, if we apply f on the second level, which we write here, notice that we've replaced the ordered pair ab, which is a list, with f of ab. And we replace the list cd with f of cd. In other words, the apply function can be used with an entire expression or it can be used with parts of an expression. Okay? Another function is the map function. And the map function applies a function to, for example, a list of elements. So if I do map f onto the list a, b, c, d, I get back the list of f of a, f of b, f of c, and f of d. Now, there's an alternative to doing that, and that is we can change the attributes of the function f to make it listable. We've discussed using attributes before. Well, one of the attributes is listable, and what listable does is it makes the function map automatically. So as soon as you define f as being a listable function, then you can just apply f directly to the list and it will immediately go inside and be applied. Okay. Now if we have a more complicated nested list structure, we can apply map in the same way that we used apply by using it at different levels. So here I map G onto a list which consists of two ordered pairs. And so what I end up with is a list. Notice that it still remains a list. And I have g, and the first argument now is g of the ordered pair a, b. 
and the second is G of the ordered pair CD. Now I can also map onto a lower level where G gets applied to the lists that are inside the list. Okay, and so if we do map G onto that list of two ordered pairs at level two, we find that G goes inside and replaces the head, which is list for AB with G, and also for CD. So now we have the list, which consists of an ordered pair, G of A, G of B, G of C, G of D. Okay, and you'll get to read through this and become familiar with it. Now, another function I want to mention is the map thread function. Now, the map thread function is, is basically very simple. Here we see it working. There's a formal definition above, but it's easiest to see it by example. Here I have map thread the function G. G could be anything, by the way. Here it's a symbol, and I call it a function. Onto two lists. What it does is it takes G, and it takes the corresponding elements of the two lists and make them into arguments of G. So this becomes G of A and X, and then G of B and Y, and then G of C and Z. And here, just to be more specific, instead of using G, let's say list. Well, when we do that, what we're going to get back will be list AX, list BY, list GCZ. And we see that that's exactly what we get in shorthand notation. Okay, and in this case, we're saying what we want to do is you want to take the corresponding elements of these two lists and we want to add them together. So what we're doing is we're going to map thread the symbol plus onto this list. And we see that that's exactly what we get. A plus X, B plus Y, and C plus Z. Now again, there are many built-in functions in the Wolfram language and they do many interesting things and it's very valuable. In fact, it's, um, it's very desirable for you to learn as many of the built-in functions that are around so that you can use them. Now, sometimes when we make a nested function call, we already discussed that, we can do that by applying the same function over and over and over again. And let me show you how that works, okay? Here I'm going to create a list. The first value in the list is 0.7. The second value is the sign of 0.7, so it's the sign of the previous element. Then we take the sign of the result of the sign of 0.7, and then we take the sign of the sign of the sign of 0.7. So what we're doing is each element in the list is taking the sign of the previous element in the list. And we see that this is what we get. But we can also do this by a simple command, which is called nest list, which says take the function 6 and apply it to point 0.7 three times in a row. When we do that, we get exactly the same result as when we had written it in the long way. So this is basically a way of doing an iteration. It's a repeated function call. Now, sometimes we don't really care about all the elements in the list. We just want the final result, in which case all we do is we use the nest command rather than the nest list command. And if we take the nest of the sign of 0.73, notice we get the same result. So it does the same thing. So that's the way that we can do a repeated operation over and over and over again. And we apply that operation to whatever the result is that we just got. All right. The thing is that when we use nest and nest list, what the last argument of nest or nest list is the number of times that you apply that function to the expression. But sometimes you don't want to keep doing it. Let's say you're watching something change and suddenly it stops changing. Well, there's no point in continuing to apply the function if it's never going to change anymore. So for that, we can basically say, perform this operation of applying a function to something and then applying the function to the result that you just got and then applying a function to the result you just got and so on and you can have it stop when either what you get back is the same as what you just had or when some condition is met. So let me show you how that's done 
That's done using the fixed point list. And here's an example. Here I'm going to put in the fixed point list of sine 0.75. Same test. What I'm doing here is I'm going to apply sine to 0.7. That'll give me the sine of 0.7. And then I'm going to take the sine of the sine of 0.7. And I'm going to keep doing that. And I'm going to do it a total of five times unless the number that I generate in doing this is less than 0.65. Once the value I get is less than 0.65, I simply stop. And so that's called the same test condition. And you see that when I apply it, notice I only got back two values. Because the second value met the requirement that it be less than 0.65. So it simply stopped. Okay? And we call that the pound two, and the pound two indicates that it's the last argument. Now, Here's the same thing, and here I have a pound one and a pound two, and what I'm doing here is I'm putting as a condition for stopping the application of the function, the condition that the last result subtracted from the result before that, in other words, the next to last result minus the last result, be less than 0 0.045. And so we see here that we get three values. And it isn't until you reach the third value, take a look at the last value, 0 0.600, and the previous value, 0 0.644, subtract one from the other, well, that value is 0 0.044, which is less than 0 0.045, so it stops. So the nestless command applies a function repeatedly a certain number of time steps, and the fixed point applies a function a certain number of time steps or until it satisfies some condition. And once that condition is satisfied, it stops applying it. Okay? The last higher order functions I want to mention are fold list and fold. And fold list gives us back, at, fold list takes as its arguments f and then some value x and then a list. And what it returns is a list whose first element is the value x, the second element will be the function f applied to x plus the first element of the list. The third element of the list that we get back will be f applied to the previous result, which is f of xa, and the second element in the list, which is b, and so on. To show that, we'll look at the example of fold plus zero with the list a, b, c, d. The first element, of course, is zero. The second element will be plus, whose arguments are zero and the first element, a, so that'll be a. The third element in the list that we get back will be the value we just got, which is a plus b, plus the third element in the list, c, so we get a plus b plus c. And finally, we get a plus b plus c plus d. Now let me give you an example and let's just look at it. Here we have fold list plus zero with a random integer table. So we have a list of five integers which consist of either zeros or ones and we're going to use that in the fold list function. And the question that we ask is in the evaluation process what were the elements in the list of five elements that we're going to use with the fold list function. Well, let's look at it. The first result we got back was zero. When that zero came from the argument to fold list, the next value we got back was one. Well, how did we get one? What it happened was that fold list took plus and applied or took as its arguments zero plus the first number in the list. And since the number we get back is one, then the first element in the list must have been 1. Then we do it again and we take the second element in the list. Well, when we do that, we got back a 1. And that means the second element in the list must have been 0 because we added that to the previous value of 1. And the third element of the list is a 2. So that means we've added 1 to the previous result, which means the third element in the list must have been a 1 because that's how we got 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. And then the next 
two values. We got back with two, and that tells us that the last two elements in the list we generated must have been zero because it didn't change the value. So the, when we actually evaluated fold list plus zero random integer, what we were really doing is we were evaluating fold list plus comma zero comma the list one zero one zero zero. And as you can see, we can go all the way back to the beginning of the lecture. What we've done in the evaluation process is we've evaluated this part, the random integer table, before we actually applied fold list. That's part of the way the evaluation occurs. And as I said, there are very many higher order functions and there are many built-in uh, rewrite rules and it behooves you to learn those. So basically what I've done in this tutorial is to explain to you how the Wolfram programming language works. We described what an expression is. An expression consists of a head, square brackets with arguments separated by commas where each argument and the head are also expressions. We describe how you evaluate an expression by asking is it first a number, is it a string, is it a symbol. Um, we also then showed how pattern matching works, which is a very powerful tool in the Wolfram language. Then we talked about how we can create our own functions. Some of them are programs that we write and some are very simple functions that we might want to write. And lastly we showed what the pro functional programming style is and we gave you a couple of examples. Shuffling a deck of cards was the primary example of how we can do functional programming. And having that, you can then begin to write both efficient and beautiful, at least in my opinion, beautiful Wolfram language programs and code. So I hope that's given you some um, indication of how the Wolfram language works and uh, will help you use it in the most efficient way possible. Thank you.